morning, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to quickly set the stage so you all have some context. Firstly, my name is Sean, and I'm a senior associate here at 500. My job is to largely work with a number of corporate investors and innovators on projects related to startup investment, as well as startup partnerships. This event is being hosted as part of our ongoing Slack community, 500 VC. 500 VC is an invite only Slack community for corporate and institutional investors to engage in helpful conversation, networking, and ultimately empower founders. We host networking events, startup presentations, and discussion series much like this one. Within the Slack group, we started the Corporate Venturing Channel to be a collaborative community through which members can share best practices and learnings, as well as enhance the perception of CBC among the startup ecosystem. If you're at all interested in joining the community, please feel free to shoot me an email, which I'll drop in the chat shortly. This event is a bi-weekly speaker series featuring a top corporate venturing practitioner sharing their unique journey to CBC, specific challenges, and best practices they've developed as a result. We'll have Q&A on, so feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll do our best to cover them throughout the session. Now that you know who we are and what's going on, I'm going to hand it over to Nicola to kick things off. Enjoy. Thank you, Sean. Very, very pleased today to have Hélène from Auric. Uh, she's an amazing person. Uh, I'm so glad she accepted to uh, take the interview and to uh, give us a new angle that we haven't covered yet in this bi-weekly series interviews on corporate venturing. For disclosure, I've worked with Hélène on 11 different deals that we all closed. So uh, it's been a pleasure working with her and, uh, and really getting to, uh, to, to close these deals, which were all very important and all nearly, I could say, different. And uh, some of them extremely complex. And not just in the US, but also Germany, uh, China, and Israel. So with that disclosure done, which I'm sure <laughs> she would have given otherwise, Hélène, uh, uh, would you mind giving us five to ten minutes introduction about you and your journey and what you do today? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity. I really appreciate the invitation and delighted to have the opportunity to talk to the 500 startups audience uh, about, you know, my journey, my role and how I came to work with CBCs. Um, my, my journey to uh, working with investors started almost 30 years ago when I graduated from law school. Um, by the time I graduated from law school in the early 90s, I think my closest connection to technology was the Mac SE computer, which was my very first computer that I got during law school um, with a dot matrix printer. And that really was the extent of my exposure to technology. And if somebody had told me then that I would someday have a career in technology in Silicon Valley, I probably would have scratched my head because it wouldn't have meant much of anything to me. But during law school, I was fortunate enough to have found an apartment in Cambridge um, that was uh, owned by a, a woman who had gone to, to school in Cambridge, but gone off to join uh, Apple as one of their early employees um, do on, uh, in a, a big project that was um, getting started at that time at Apple. And during, I, I was fortunate to rent that apartment from her for all three years during law school. And she would tell me about Silicon Valley. She lived in Cupertino, which in those days really didn't mean much of anything to me, but you know, she would tell me about her job at Apple. And that was really sort of my first connection to Silicon Valley and you know, what the world of technology looked like. Um, fast forward a little bit, I graduated from law school, fully intentioned to uh, practice in New York where I was where I grew up and, and thought I would have a career but in the sort of early part of the mid 90s I kept getting calls from some law school friends of mine who were actually out in Silicon Valley as well as some business school classmates of mine who bucking the trend uh, at Wharton which was mostly to go to New York and, uh, and join an investment bank had gone to Silicon Valley and were doing really interesting things in technology and um, they kept calling saying, you should come to California. Everything that's interesting is happening here in Silicon Valley. What are you doing in stodgy East Coast? And uh, you know, I think thinking back to the conversations with my landlord and her enthusiasm and excitement um, on a, a truly, this was serendipitous because on almost a whim, very impetuously, I 
decided to send out eight resumes. I thought, why not? You know, I'll take a chance for a year and see what it's like to be in California. And uh, that's exactly what I did. I was put in touch with Craig Johnson, who was really an icon in the legal industry back in, at, at that time in the mid 90s, uh, a trailblazer in his own right in terms of what does it look like to be a legal advisor in the tech and venture ecosystem. He had started a firm called the Venture Law Group. Um, we had many conversations around you know, what would my journey west uh, look like. And uh, I ultimately came out, I have to say, I, I wasn't the trailblazer that he was. I was still the you know, risk averse East Coast New Yorker. So instead of joining Venture Law Group, which was a startup uh, itself, I joined the, you know, the behemoth technology uh, law firm, which seemed like the right place to go, you know, in my first moments in Silicon Valley. But I landed in Silicon Valley and that really began what has now been a 25 year career here um, in Silicon Valley, working with technology companies almost exclusively. Um, so uh, in the early days of my career in Silicon Valley, I, I worked with, which was similar to my early days on the East Coast practicing with lots of large companies. Um, you know, big companies in uh, semiconductor companies and security companies and, um, you know, enterprise companies, all sorts of technology. I was pretty industry agnostic, but large companies. Um, I really wasn't working in those days with uh, some of the, you know, smaller venture backed startup companies. And I was focused on uh, doing, you know, sort of more capital markets and uh, m and and uh, I, I actually did litigation for quite a while as well. And so deal, doing proxy contests, I actually was the, the young partner on the HP compact merger litigation um, in Delaware. But uh, in the sort of late 90s, that was a really crazy time in Silicon Valley where companies were, you know, almost overnight, they were having to traverse that maturation arc uh, from very young startup mentality to what does it mean to becoming a mature and now newly public company. And that was a great opportunity for me to uh, really get in front of boards of directors of now younger companies and help them on that journey. Having you know, really spent time kind of at the more mature end of the spectrum and seeing what that looked like, it allowed me to back up and help young companies anticipate what does that journey look like? How do they prepare today for getting where they're at least you know, um, anticipating they will end. Um, and at the same time, coupled with that, almost as soon as I arrived in California, I met my now uh, partner and, and uh, spouse of almost as many years. Uh, and he was a young, budding uh, venture capitalist, barely out of uh, Stanford Business School. And, uh, and so that became part of my journey, really living in the venture space. And many of my friends were in the venture world. I met you know, lots of companies in the venture world. And so those you know, the two parts of my life kind of collided, the personal part and the professional part. Um, and I was really um, excited working with young founders and uh, early entrepreneurs and helping them, advising them, how do you make that journey? So I would say that was sort of my, the way I came both to technology and to venture. Um, that those, you know, earlier experiences in the venture space and touch points, you know, obviously there was the crash uh, in 2000, 2001, um, and that was a really interesting time to live through. Um, uh, and then the run up to 2008, and I would say increasingly over the years, I became more and more focused uh, in the venture back space, really started to shift my focus uh, over those years, and uh, ultimately co-founded a law firm actually with one of my partners in the venture back space, focused in exclusively in representing companies on the corporate side in the venture space. And then I folded that practice into Oric when I joined Oric back in 2018. So, um, you know, a, a definitely a journey. Um, I, I really love working with startup companies. I love working with investors. I do both. I, I've done both for a long time and I still do both. I work with lots of investors, both financial investors and corporate investors, um, strategic investors. Um, uh, I, I really think it's a great opportunity for me to bring uh, that experience uh, from both what does it look like to be on the financial investment side to my representation of corporate VCs and vice versa. You know, it, it allows me to really, I think, articulate what are the areas of focus, what are the pain points, what are the areas of sensitivity, 
um, that I think benefits you know, both, both sides of that equation in, in my own practice. Um, when I work with investors, I'm really doing a lot of things. And I'm sorry for this phone ringing. I didn't even know I, there was a phone here. Um, on the, when I work with investors, I'm really advising on a lot of things. I'm advising on strategy. How should they think about financing strategy? Many times the CVC is not going to lead a deal. Sometimes they do, but oftentimes they're part of the investing syndicate. What does that look like? How do they think about the investment? How do they approach the negotiation? Um, if they are going to lead a deal, how do they structure the deal? How do they propose a term sheet that meets their needs, but also, you know, is going to, you know, be well received by the company? Um, we, we work a lot and I work a lot with my clients on corporate governance issues. Um, you know, what are the key issues and how do you think about the right structure for the board and, and different issues that relate to corporate governance? A lot of uh, focus on obviously due diligence in the financing process, uh, which is a big focus as you, you know, go through a financing event, you know, and obviously negotiation of the financing documents. That's a key part of what we do with our investor clients, represent them in connection with investments, helping them both understand the financing documents, understand how the terms uh, interplay and, you know, where the trade-offs are, what the risks are. Um, but, you know, overall, I would say my clients really come to me to be an advisor. Um, to, my role really is to help my clients weigh and assess the legal risks and the benefits of the deals that they're contemplating, um, you know, and, and to really help identify where there are legal risks that pose potentially real issues for them and for the business they're investing in. Um, you know, I think that really at the end of the day is, is a critical role we play is helping to flag those things. Um, for some of my, uh, my foreign based uh, investor clients, we have to deal with the regulatory landscape if they're going to be investing in U.S. companies. Um, but I've also uh, had uh, U.S. based clients who are investing in, uh, you know, companies abroad and there are foreign regulatory landscape issues to deal with. Um, so we really deal with a, a myriad of things in my practice. I would say I'm, I'm a very hands-on advisor. Nicholas, you might uh, know this as well as anyone, given how much we work together. Um, I try to make myself uh, available pretty much at all times, kind of around the clock, um, for better or for worse for my clients. But I know that being responsive and uh, dependable, especially in the heat of a deal, is really important to clients. Um, you know, for, for young, for my young CVC clients, I would say a part of my role, I think, is um, really educating and helping my, you know, less experienced CVC clients uh, understand both the nuances and the big picture, uh, really walking them through deal terms, getting them facile and familiar with, with how deals are structured and where they fit in, you know, how does the stake that they're taking in the company translate in terms of the legal rights that they will have. Um, for some of my more mature clients, that might mean, you know, helping, as I said, to structure the term sheet um, and, and, you know, really think through what's going to be um, well received by the company, but also allow for the right investor syndicate to make the deal viable. I hope that that's a, a helpful bit of background, but, um, Kind of what, how I got here and what I do. Thank you, Ellen. This is really a good introduction. I, I can definitely comment about the dependable hands on advisor. Uh, you've definitely been very responsive. And what I appreciate the most is that you're not just giving me the advice and letting me decide. If you feel like I'm going in the wrong way, you will push back. And that pushback that's pushback. That's the New Yorker in me. And, and that's fine. The point is, if, 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 you felt, and it happened a few times where you felt like I was going in the wrong path or decision making. And the pushback was really helpful, not necessarily to go with what you were proposing initially, but to find actually the, the, a better option. So that Absolutely. was really, really good. Um, you mentioned that um, you met with Craig Johnson, an icon. Mm -hmm. And whenever it's someone that's so big in our career path, I, I always ask, what is the one or two lessons you learned from someone like that person? Is there, is there a lesson that you applied today that you learned from him? That's a really good question. Um, 
those those early conversations and you know it was a, a kind of a random introduction i you know when i made the decision that i was going to you know take this chance um which for me was a big deal as the somewhat conservative risk averse new yorker i was to take this chance and you know on a kind of on a whim move to california um we were introduced uh through uh, quite frankly the harvard uh, law school office of career placement he had spoken on campus and to rave reviews and uh, they said you should call this guy he spoke on campus he was fabulous and th that fortuitous introduction was really the start of um you know my journey he he was just he had just left wilson sunstein to start the venture law group as i said very much a startup it was a new concept in how to provide legal services to the startup community and uh what I really learned from him was, um, you know, how to think outside the box, how to think big. I mean, he was really thinking big and he was really bold and audacious in what he was doing. And I think that was, um, it, it very much married with the experience I had on the ground when I arrived, but uh, was a great introduction for me to Silicon Valley and the difference in mindset. I would say uh, mindset is everything. And uh, almost immediately the, entrepreneurial mindset, the mindset of, of being able to be comfortable with, with more risk uh, was, was palpable and I would say palpable in those early conversations with him. Um, and probably were the reasons why I, you know, my, my legal path has not been, you know, plodding along in the most obvious of ways. I've taken a very unusual turn. I was a litigation partner in a big firm before I was a corporate partner in a big firm. That is a very unusual thing to do, but I think having uh, the boldness to do that was partly driven by seeing others who had been, uh, you know, audacious in their goals, aspirations, and what they felt they could achieve. Very nice, very nice. So I want to ask a few questions about Oric, and then we'll go generic about corporate VC, corporate venturing. Uh, Oric has a few things that are quite special when we look at the website, so it's public domain. One is your startup toolkit online, which is really geared towards the startups. Do you, do you have um, maybe an explanation about why you started this and yeah. what's the engagement behind it? Yeah, I'm going to actually answer that question by backing up a step um, and provide a little bit of context for that. Uh, Oric has been an, a leader in innovation in the legal landscape for many years. Uh, Oric has been named the most innovative law firm the four last consecutive years, Oric was named the most innovative law firm in America for three of those four years. And in the fourth year, which was last year, we were named the first runner up. And my theory is just, we couldn't be named again a fourth time. They had to put someone else in the top spot. Um, but our, our uh, chief innovation officer has been named the most innovative lawyer in America. It is part of the fabric of Oric. And actually this relates to the story I just told about the venture law group in Craig Johnson because the tech companies group at Oric, which is where I sit as part of our tech practice, actually is comprised of many of the former VLG lawyers who had that very entrepreneurial mindset and spirit of innovation to take a chance on the venture law group. They're all now at Oric. Um, and it was a big, big part of the impetus for my joining Oric was to really rejoin a group of practitioners who really think that way, have that innovative mindset um, there are many, many things that work does that stand out and have been, you know, well recognized uh, in the legal industry and, you know, in the press more, more broadly um, to contribute in different ways, both to the legalist, uh, legal ecosystem, but also um, to the ecosystems of our clients. Um, and the startup toolkit, I think, is, is just is one of those many innovations. It's, you know, it's our way of providing a, a low cost opportunity for founders who need help getting off the ground. Um, you know, it, uh, the ability to provide a set of best in class forms. Uh, ORIC was, uh, is all of the clerky forms uh, emanated from the ORIC forms. There's a strong uh, relationship between uh, ORIC and clerky. Um, you know, we've been involved in many initiatives. My partner, John Batista, probably uh, in my mind, for sure, one of the most innovative lawyers in America uh, has been at the forefront of uh, the long-term long -term stock exchange um, and Stripe Atlas. And, uh, you know, we just, we've, we've really been at the forefront of trying to help the startup community in every way we can, and the Startup Toolkit is one of those. 
Very nice. So my last question about Auric. Uh, you also have a Auric Labs incubator. Can you just describe what it is and if it, if it is part of the DNA of Auric? It is absolutely, as I think I just, you know, I probably the context I just provided really drives home the point that it, it is absolutely part of the DNA of Auric. Um, our, our Auric Labs is sort of an internal incubator where we are working on technology that we can deploy in our practice. Our focus on innovation is at many levels. It's not just, you know, how do we create new legal tech, which is the focus of Auric Labs, but also how do we innovate in the way that we provide legal services to our clients, the way we think about the, the industries and ecosystems in which we operate and advise. Um, and Auric Labs, uh, actually, just to give an example of an uh, a really amazing uh, piece of innovation that came out of Oric Labs is a product called our Oric Dashboard, which we use in our tech company's practice. It is uh, the first of its kind in the sort of legal landscape of providing uh, a, uh, a really functional, robust workspace where we, when we have a company client, but also our investor clients, um, can have a repository of all of the most important documents on the company side for the company. So their, you know, constitutional documents, their uh, minute book for their, for, you know, sort of governance, their closing volumes, um, you know, all of their equity administration documents, all fully taxonomized in a, in a, an interactive, robust construct that was developed at Oric Labs. We actually just spun that out. Um, that actually, that is now a standalone company that's itself getting venture funded. Um, and there are many innovations like that that have come out of the labs. And in fact, this past year, we announced uh, our first ever fund. Um, uh, it's an, an org innovation fund that's really, that will be focused on investing dollars in companies that are innovating in the legal landscape. So oh, all wow. of so you're doing your own uh, corporate venturing now. Yeah. So, you know, all of those things come together. And I think they're all a testament to the, again, going back to what I said before about mindset being so important, the mindset of work and where we want to be directionally as, a, as an innovative leader, innovative thinker in the spaces in which we play. Very nice. So let me go back to one thing you said during your introduction, which I think probably is very useful for many people to have your tech. You mentioned about professional and personal colliding. And the word is probably subconscious, but there's a, a crash concept in colliding. So could you give maybe a, a few tips for people who are listening today about how to manage really well when you ha indeed have an overlap between professional and personal? Yeah, uh, that's really a, a really interesting um, question. I have a really good story about that. <laughs> Um, but I probably, probably not the best way to handle that. The, the story is that um, many, many years ago, uh, when I first came out to Silicon Valley, some of the partners who had recruited me to, to come out um, and to you know, make the trip west were determined once I got here that I would stay and not go back to my you know, roots on the East Coast. And in those days, it was a little different, obviously, than the, than the world is today. Um, I think they thought that if I you know, had a personal connection, there would be a greater likelihood I would stay. And there is so, yes, an anchor. Um, and there was a little bit of blurring of the personal and professional lines that itself had its own course collision where I had to, you know, make it clear those needed to stay separate. Um, but the end result was great because actually the introduction that was made is my you know, now partner of 25 years. So it all worked out. Um, but I would say, uh, for me, it really was a matter of uh, always, I, I believe in being a professional at all times in, in my professional life. Um, though my personal life can't intrude on my professional life, I try not to have my professional life intrude on my personal life, but you know, of course, sometimes that happens um, just because of the nature of what I do, right? I'm a service provider and an, an advisor. And when you're in that sort of trusted role, advisory role, you have to make yourself available. Um, and, I, and I try to do that. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't always flow equally in both directions, that separation. But um, for me, it's been a great benefit. Um, and I, I've tried to view it as a great opportunity. Um, I've made uh, so many connections in my personal world that have 
translated into my professional world. I mean, I think that's part of being in Silicon Valley is that network effect. Um, you know, the more people you meet, the more relationships you have. I'm a very relationship driven person. You know, I believe in the power. I mean, this is hard, the world we're living in today with COVID, because I really believe in the power of, of those personal moments and um, personal connections that are, you know, harder in a fully distributed remote environment. But um, those really, I think, come back and pay huge dividends over time. And I have definitely found that in my own life and career here. I mean, you know, I've been here a very long time. Um, I've done a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, I, though all of the different pieces of my life in many ways have contributed to where I am today. So, I, you know, my, my advice there is view everything as an opportunity, um, but be authentic. You know, I, I never view a relationship in the moment as, you know, as worthwhile just because it may bear fruit in my professional career. I think it's just a natural organic product of developing really good, great relationships that people trust you, they learn what you're capable of, and ultimately, you know, will it, it will pay off in your professional career. So being very genuine and authentic. Uh, I love your answer. No, now let's let's move to corporate venturing. Um, if I look at TDK, they had done 10 minority investments in the previous three years before we started talking about a corporate VC. So clearly you don't need a corporate VC to do this kind of open innovations and investments and in startups and so on. What's your view of when does it make sense to do a corporate VC and maybe when it doesn't make sense to do a corporate VC? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I think it, it really, um, it makes sense. I mean, I think it, I personally think it makes sense for many companies, whether the company is ready is a different question. I think a company is ready and it makes sense when there's real buy-in. Again, it goes back to that. Um, you know, what's the, what, is there an innovative mentality? Is there, you know, a commitment to wanting to learn what's happening outside of the corporate organization? in the world. I think it's more important than ever today for, for companies, large companies, to understand what's happening outside of the walls of the organization because it's easy to get leapfrog, right? Technology has, you know, has an incredible ramp um, and you know, what seems like a, a minor factor in an ecosystem could almost overnight become you know, the dominant player in the space. It's really important to be connected and to understand to have you know access to that information, and so so I think a, a corporation is really ready when it adopts that mindset, when it you know is is interested and committed to wanting to be a participant in the you know world of innovation, not just what you can do in an R and D capability inside an organization, organization, but looking outside and seeing what's happening outside your walls that could be mutually beneficial, beneficial to the the corporate and beneficial to the startup. There are a lot of opportunities for uh, great relationships and being having your eyes open and a mindset of adoption um, of taking advantage of those, I think is key to a company deciding it's gonna launch a CVC. Um, I think it really goes, it, it, it has to be driven by a real introspection, really at the leadership level of the company around what are the goals you know, what are, what are we looking to do? And uh, do those goals, um, are they augmented by having a CVC effort? You know, if, if a, a strategic, a long, also I guess I'm backing up, I think it's really important for a company to have a long-term strategic vision, right? That has to marry. There has to be a long-term strategic vision that marries with a desire to actually participate in this landscape. So, you know, are there financial goals? Are there strategic goals? Are there commercial goals? Are there information goals? Are there technology development goals? Um, you know, does the company want to test the waters in a particular market that it may not have pl be playing in today? Um, there are lots of reasons why it may make sense. And I think having a mindset of wanting to be committed and explore those is really the first step. I, I totally resonate with both commitment and long-term vision. And when I started uh, looking at corporate VCs, I was told a sentence, which is, you only become a corporate VC when you survived a CEO change. Mm -hmm. So 
can you share maybe your view about how important it is to um, to fit the long term vision of the company and yet find a way to be uh, to survive this kind of changes that could happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, it, it, you know, in today's world, I think there's more recognition than there ever has been about the importance of um, the long term strategic vision and and taking advantage of all the innovation that's happening. You know, corporations can be slow, they can be somewhat risk averse. Um, it's injecting that sort of innovative spirit, I think, is what helps drive a lot of success among larger companies and the ability to really um, develop technologies that are addressing real pain points in the market. If you never get out and understand what those pain points are, if you're not testing, you know, what's viable and possible uh, beyond your boundaries, it's really, it, you know, I think it's hard to even formulate what this long-term strategic vision is because you're, you're automatically stunted in your thinking by not understanding what the bigger picture looks like. So, you know, I think it, it's, it's a really critical part of what corporations should be thinking about if they're not. Um, and whether that's investing through a dedicated CVC, you know, I think a lot of corporations start sort of in baby steps. They're not ready to launch a full CVC. We've seen lots launched um, and you know more and more and bigger commitments and larger funds um, and more staying power right I mean you know in in the old days you know and I, I hate to use the phrase but in the old days corporates were not really viewed as the smart money in a deal they were um, you know the financial investors weren't excited to have a you know a corporate in the investing syndicate and that's completely flipped today right today, having a corporate investor actually validate, is often very validating um, to the investment thesis, uh, you know, and, and the prospects of the company, because there's so much the corporate can offer in the way of access and customers and technology and R&D, um, you know, commercial capabilities. There's just, there's sort of an endless possible network effect of having those relationships that I think, um, has to has to be part of the long-term strategic vision of a corporate. Thank you, Ellen. Actually, um, I forgot to mention, but to the audience, if you have questions you want me to ask, you can put it in the Q and A. And and you said uh, something, and I wanted to ask a question, and it came from the audience. I'm going to read the question, but that was going to be something I wanted to ask. What are some of the baby steps that a corporate can take to begin investing? To what? to begin investing. So what are these baby steps you were alluding to? Yeah, well, you know, I think there has to be deliberation. I, I don't think a corporate wants to just, you know, without much structure, without advanced deliberation, without goals, clear plan, how does, you know, the, any particular investment fit into a thesis? I think the corporation has to do a lot of deliberate planning around, you know, what are, again, what are its goals? Once you know that and you, you know, have an idea of what you're trying to achieve, you have to then have the capability to evaluate what's in the marketplace that makes sense as a possible investment target. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, do, do corporates sometimes take chances and invest in companies? Um, they do. I think the better approach is, and we see a lot of corporates actually doing internal incubation, internal acceleration. Um, you know, incubating from within. There's sort of the incubating and, and innovating from within, and there's, you know, also sort of investing in companies that are external to the organization. Some companies do it, they start in, internally. I, I have clients that do that, started that way before they actually started a venture fund. They started to, you know, have a group internally that was focused on an innovative effort that was related to the long-term strategy of the company. You know, they allowed their R&D team to sort of come up with some audacious, you know, te technology ideas um, and goals and, you know, allowed funding for those over a particular and prescribed period of time with a, you know, particular pot of money to see, you know, how far could they get in 12 weeks, six and whether that idea was worth, you know, ultimately uh, investing from within. So I would say a lot of companies start that way as a baby step. Um, but again, even from within, I think it's really important that, that those efforts be tied to a really deliberate strategic planning process. You know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Who's going to be involved? What are the 
uh, metrics? How will we measure whether that early incubated idea you know, is worth investing more dollars in, more time in, more focus? So uh, even from within, I think having the right metrics um, and the right compensation plan in place is really important. Very nice. And um, let's assume that now they've taken these baby steps and they are ready to plunge and, and start a corporate VC. Uh, there are many ways to set up a corporate VC, uh, on and off balance sheets and separate companies. Can you walk us through what are the very high level trade-offs between the various ways of starting a corporate VC once you've decided to do it? Yeah. Um, well, you, what you just said is, is entirely true. Um, it's done different ways. Uh, I have clients doing corporate venture off the balance sheet, and I have clients, TDK among them, doing corporate venture through separate standalone uh, you know, entities that have their own separate corporate existence. Um, you know, I think the general sort of viewpoint historically has, has been that when you're doing balance sheet investing, it's, it's more tenuous potentially in an economic downturn. If the corporation has to do sort of cost containment and expense cutting, you know, what happens to the you know, line item that's dedicated for you know, venture invest, corporate venture investing? There's always a worry that it gets squeezed and that that sort of, again, that long-term vision, that long-term commitment can be hampered. Um, it, it's, you know, I think bolder um, in many ways, but in some ways safer to have a separate standalone entity. You know, when, when TDK decided, and you know, maybe I should throw it back to you, you can maybe talk about the reasons TDK decided to um, have a separate investing entity, um, which, you know, we were really uh, thrilled to work with you to set up. Um, it, as a legal construct, the separate corp corporate entity is a standalone. So it's insular in the sense that it protects the, the bigger balance sheet of the mothership because you know, it's got its own corporate legal existence uh, and, um, and there's sort of the, you know, a corporate uh, veil between the, ve the venture corporate VC and the mothership. Um, so it has some legal protections and you know, reasons why it makes sense. But I also think you know, it, it does allow, it, it shows a real level of commitment that the corporate has gone ahead and actually set up a separate entity. I think it, it has a, a cachet in the market. There's an opportunity to really market that separate entity. Um, I think for purposes of developing a team, which we haven't talked about, but, you know, clearly having experienced uh, and committed and capable um, professionals who are, you know, helping to guide, steer, and invest on behalf of, this, of the CBC is pretty critical. Um, and I think there's a lure uh, of the, for, for some of the reasons I just said, uh, of a separate entity that, you know, has its own, uh, you know, fund that can't, can't be sort of, you know, modified in an in a economic downturn, right? That there's going to be a committed pot of money that's available for investing. So, um, you yeah, know, I think that uh, companies do it different ways. I think, I kind of like this, the idea of this separate entity. I, I know you had, um, you talked to the uh, head of Sony Innovation Fund, um, and I remember you asked that question about, uh, you know, why did, why, how are they structured and why, and uh, had they considered sort of a separate corporate existence? And I think what you heard uh, in, in that response is, is what we hear a lot. They're not quite ready. They're thinking about it. They think that's probably what they ultimately will do, but they're not quite there yet. Um, you know, we're still in the big picture. We're still in many ways in the early days of CBC investing. Um, you know, I, I think we're seeing a really different level of commitment, uh, both in terms of dollars, but staying power from CBCs after the 2008 crash. Um, you know, there was a tremendous retraction in corporate investing. You know, so far, at least in this recession, I, I, you know, I looked at the most recent pitch book stats and they're really optimistic. Um, in terms of the staying power of CDCs today versus, you know, that the global financial crisis of 2008. So I think that makes a big difference. And, um, you know, if there's a mindset and conviction around staying the course, you know, we may see more standalone CDCs. I think I agree with you. We are very early days. Um, global corporate venturing uh, issued some statistics showing that in the last 12 months, there was about 700 first-time corporate investors. 
Exactly. So clearly, we're, we're just getting started. It's very early days. You were asking about TDK. The, the, if I was to really simplify the reason, it's really the wish for TDK, our CEO, our top management, to give a very strong signal to the entrepreneurs who are going to be there for the very long term. And that's why we had a separate farm, separate company. It, it's actually to the point where the money was in the bank account. Uh, it's not like I need to make capital calls. The, the money was already there. <laughs> and, and part of it was a signal about the long term, which also, in, it's not just the entrepreneurs in a way, it's also the uh, co-investors to know that we will follow the investment. We have the money to follow despite any downturn. And I remember we had this discussion, uh, Elena, where we made our fourth investment during COVID-19. And to me, that was a proof point. Until the point we could make an investment during COVID-19, I could not say we were really a corporate VC. But once we started it, and now we had 11 deals, uh, we have the proof point. So I think that was the, the why. Yeah, um, and I think, you just, I think the point you made just now is really important. I think the message that it signals to the companies and to other investors that you're in it, that you're going to participate and follow on. You're not going to, you know, in a moment of need in that company that you, you know, made an early investment in, that you're going to be there to help that company see through, you know, maybe a potential tough time like COVID-19. I mean, we've seen lots of startups that have needed bridge rounds, um, you know, unexpectedly where they thought they would raise, you know, a next equity round, but things have been pushed out. Having investors who are there, who they feel confident will be there for them is really, you know, pretty critical, both in a company selection, you know, and uh, invitation and acceptance of investors in a round. But as you said, I think very astutely, you know, how do the, the corporates work together with the financial investors and what does that relationship look like? And are you going to be viewed as a valued part of the investor syndicate? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to... Um, Take a question from the audience, which I will make it smaller to start because okay. you, just, you just talked about follow investments and I feel like follow investments is more of an art than a science. And, and the question from the audience is about, uh, actually they say thank you, Ellen, which I should say, uh, but they talk about the common mistakes made uh, by um, corporate clients uh, investing into startups. And before we go too wide, what do you see as the mistakes uh, along the follow investments? Yeah, well, I think actually that's an interesting question because I think some, especially, you know, sort of maybe earlier or newer CVCs, they don't really think about, you know, what is it, you know, what is it, what does it look like, you know, after we make that initial investment? And, uh, you know, you have to remind them that it's not just about making that first investment. It's about, you know, making that first investment and being committed to stay the course with that company that you've invested in. I mean, at some point there, you know, it may make sense to not put additional funds in, but you know, you, you shouldn't make the investment with the mindset that that's the only investment you're going to make in that company. So, uh, you know, pacing investments and thinking through the follow on strategy is really important. And I've seen lots of corporate venture um, clients not really think through their investment pace and their allocation and you know, the size of rounds they're gonna participate in because they haven't fully thought about what funds will be available for follow-on rounds. So I think the first thing is really thinking about that upfront um, and you know, having your arms around how much are you investing you know, in first round investments and what's gonna be available for those follow-on rounds. Um, you know, and I, I think they're really bespoke, um, the follow-on, you know, rounds, when they come, what the terms are, you know, each deal is different. It's hard to prescribe just because there are so many nuances. Um, but generally speaking, if you're excited about the technology and um, you're achieving the goals in that investment that you set out to achieve the objectives, whether they're informational or financial or strategic or commercial, um, you know, evaluating whether it makes sense to do a participate in a follow on in light of those objectives, I think is the right, at least the right framework for considering the investment. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the reputational cost of not following, because when I, when I was learning about corporate VC, I was told this is the reason why they don't get new deals is when they don't follow while they still believe in the company. So can you talk about the reputational yeah. cost? Because that's something that probably many corporate don't understand about 
the VC world, especially yeah. with financial VCs being some of the partners? The venture community, it's big, but it's small. Everybody knows everybody. And that's true in the in corporate VC. It's true, you know, in the VC community generally. Um, and it's, uh, whereas corporate venture might have been a little bit more insular, there's so much, um, you know, sort of, there's so much corporate investing into sort of, you know, U.S., uh, uh, financial investor led rounds today. There's corporates, you know, in more than half of the deals that have taken place so far in 2020. So that nexus is really tightly woven today. And your reputation is everything. Um, you know, who you are as an investor, whether, and, and that's true, not just about whether you're going to be there in a follow on round, but how easy are you to work with? You know, are you participating at a level of um, contribution? that is what you promised? Did you bring value as the strategic investor to that company? Those are all metrics that the financial investors are looking at in choosing um, you know, when they lead rounds, what corporates they want to have sitting at the table with them. Um, and and you know, are you, again, are you easy to work with? Do people you know, like you? I, I mean, I, you know, I hate to use the sort of playground analogy, but you know, it's a small sandbox. And if you play you know, well and nicely in the sandbox and you know, develop a good reputation, the likelihood is that you'll sit at more tables or you'll have more access to the sand playthings in the sandbox. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 the analogy, but um, <laughs> I really get the point. This is, it feels big, but this is small and your reputation, maybe some of it is because corporate VCs did not have a good reputation in the past. And therefore, you just need to make one mistake and you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, just as an, you know, an example of that, um, you know, I, I was actually representing a financial investor in a round uh, where they were leading and a corporate investor who wanted to be part of the syndicate was making all kinds of demands about uh, terms that it wanted really sort of bespoke for itself that would provide great you know, advantages potentially to that corporate uh, investor. And that really didn't sit well with you know, the lead investors and quite frankly, didn't sit well with the company. Um, and it, it, you could see almost palpably the reputation of that corporate decline in the you know, just weeks around that conversation. Um, and I, I guarantee that the next time that corporate investor faces a deal with, you know, one of the financial investors who were participating and privy to that negotiation, they won't forget that, soon, you know, anytime soon. I think, you know, it was, it, I, it was almost, ang you know, created some angst for me because I, you know, I, it wasn't my client, but I, you know, wished somebody had been advising that, that corporate. And that's the value of the pushback. And, and maybe that, that's a good leg way for something that is so important, but may not maybe misunderstood, which is the side letters yeah. and how to make sure the side letters are not asking too much, but ask what really matters. I mean, there's issues, for example, where you need to do something about it, right. but can you talk about side letters in a way that's palpable for the audience? Yeah. Um, you know, in the, it, at, at the highest level, a side letter can address anything, right? I mean, you can ask for anything with side letter. The question is, what do you want to ask for and what makes sense strategically? Um, and what do you really, really need? Um, and, you know, maybe it's that you're, you're a corporate investor and you're not getting a board observer seat in the financing docs, but part of, or a critical part maybe even, of the reason for the corporate's invest investment in that company is to have a window of insight into, you know, sort of information gathering or market. Um, and so without having a nexus that allows the corporate investor to achieve those objectives and bring back knowledge, if knowledge capture is really an objective, there's not a lot of um, strategic value in the investment. That's something, you know, that if it's really strategically important, might be a, a really appropriate uh, side letter provision. Sometimes, um, I mean, again, each deal is bespoke. Each syndicate is uh, unique. Um, so, you know, what you can ask for and what you think will sit well, both with the company and with the other investors, particularly around 
uh, issues um, surrounding corporate governance, for example, can be touchy. You have to have, I would say, a great deal of sensitivity as the corporate investor and really ask for what you really need. If you don't really need it, it's a want to have, but not a need to have, you may be viewed as sort of being too pushy. Um, on the other hand, where you can articulate real rounded justification rationale, why it makes sense and why what you're asking for ultimately will lead to greater value for the company. So just going back to that example, you know, if you, you know, if you get a board observer seat in a side letter because you didn't get, you know, you weren't able to negotiate it in the uh, main financing docs and that uh, ability to sort of have a window of insight into what's happening at the board level allows you to offer opportunities to that startup either you know, with your customer base or in your markets or you know, allows you to have a window of insight that you wouldn't otherwise have that turns out to be beneficial for the company. I think you know, that's something that's relatable. Um, it doesn't sound like you're just asking for it for the sake of asking for it because you want what they have. Absolutely. So I need to say one thing, which is you're a Lego firm. And every time in the audience, I'm sure it's the same, we hear bespoke, we, we think cost and it's going to be costly. And in, in practice, actually, we work together on, um, on making sure that we could have some uh, repeatability and cost efficiency. And I feel like you could give a, a few tips probably to the audience about, even though everything is bespoke, there are ways to be smart yeah. about it. Absolutely. Um, so let me start by saying that I think for a new CVC, um, and this has been true of all of my, um, you know, sort of newer CVC clients, uh, pretty much across the board when they're in their, the early days, um, there's a lot of education. So I think the legal costs are necessarily higher in the beginning, one, because they're learning. As the advisor and the lawyer, you, you know, have an, an obligation to educate. That takes sometimes time. Um, there's sort of the mothership concept, construct uh, with a corporate, which is, you know, there's often a legal team internal to the organization that has never done a deal like this. And they want to understand and they need to understand because they need to you know, run it through the right sort of channels internally to get buy off, buy in and sign off ultimately. So they need to understand too. So there's a lot of education in the early days. I would say the cost is almost always necessarily bigger in the early days. But you know, what happens over time is you, um, there's a cadence that develops. You know, when we first started working together, I didn't really you know, have as much of an insight into what is TDK as an organization? You know, what are the things that matter to TDK? You know, where does it draw its own sort of boundaries on risk and uh, you know, what does it need for full assessment of an investment opportunity? Um, those are things you learn over the course of a couple of, you know, maybe a few deals, a handful of the early deals. You start to get a sense of what's the rhythm and the cadence. That then opens up the opportunity to create processes. And what you and I have done is to really think about how can we um, create mechanisms that allow for, as you said, repeatability and efficiency. So just as an example, if, if I'm, a, can I, can I share this? Yes. So, so, I think it's very useful for the audience. So I'm, okay. I'm totally approving you sharing our efficiency. Uh, okay. So, so Nicola and I have, uh, and, and the team and I have sort of a, what we call, uh, it's an approach to diligence, right? Because diligence is often, you know, one of the most time consuming parts of an investment. How much diligence are you going to do? Um, and Nicola will tell me right at the beginning, uh, and we sort of, we have a scale that we've, you know, over time, we've kind of dealt, is this a diligence light effort? Is this a diligence medium effort? Is this a diligence heavy effort? So right away, we sort of have an idea. Now, having, you know, sort of these concepts between us of what does that mean? You know, what does diligence light look like? What are we going, what are the steps we're going to undertake in the diligence process when it's a light effort versus what does it look like when it's a deeper dive heavy effort? Um, and communication is paramount. Um, you know, being in touch constantly and making sure that you're in sync around it in advance, not after the fact, you know, here are the steps that we think make sense in light of, you know, a diligence light construct in this particular deal, right? It may not be the same in every single deal because every company is different. It, it may be, you know, one deal is a seed round and the other is a series F round. Well, Diligence light in the seed context is going to be very different from diligence light in a series F round. So you have to calibrate.
but having that cali calibration occur on the heels of conversation and communication is really, really critical to developing a plan and making sure that you, you know, I'm, you know, my obligation is to staff it properly to keep the cost down. But you know, there, there are other repeatable processes that, that you develop, can develop over time. I think if you're, as you know, I, as we are, and I, I hope all good legal practitioners are um, focused on developing with their clients. So, you know, in uh, TDK's case, and is true with most uh, of my, uh, all, almost all of my investor clients, whether they're CBC or financial advisors, you know, there has to be investment committee approval of the deal. Oftentimes that's, you know, a two-step process or a multi-step process. It's not, you know, just a one-time thing. How do you approach those, those uh, pivot moments? What does the investment committee need to see? Both, you know, from the, the CBC team, on the business side, but what do they need to see from the leak from the lawyers um, to approve that deal? And you know, can you sort of routinize an approval process? You know, when you get to the end, so you know, we've created this construct for the board approval in the case of TDK, uh, where we have sort of an investment summary that we fill out with each investment. Um, and it's something that we can anticipate, we know we're going to need to do. So, you know, just become part of the routine and pace of uh, the investments that, that you guys are making. Um, and, and knowing that we're doing, that we're going to do that allows us to be thoughtful along the way so that we're prepared to, to put that investment summary together and we're kind of working on it as we go. So it's you know, much more cost efficient than if we were scrambling at the end to get it done. Thank you, Ellen. And actually what you said about what we got to a point where we give a scale about how light or heavy the due diligence is. Maybe I can share a little bit because I think that could be really useful. We've decided to go very heavy in due diligence when it was us being sole investor in a seed company in China. That made a lot of sense to really go heavy on the due diligence. We went uh, medium due diligence when we were co-lead uh, in a company called Genetesis because we were co lead so we felt like we had someone, but we still wanted to do a good uh, amount of due diligence. And when we join later round, and it's more about making sure that we have all the compliance sorted, this is more of the light version. So I think everything is, is uh, bespoke, but to have this understanding about how heavy we want to go and how fast we want to go is extremely helpful. And I recommend the audience when, when they engage with a legal firm to actually really be explicit about that. Uh, yeah. Because I don't think all legal firms will actually assume correctly or check and they may end up doing less or more than is expected. So I think that's really important. Maybe we are getting to the top of the hour, so maybe one more question which could be useful is, what would be your best tip for um, a new client in terms of engaging with a new legal firm? What, what is the best way to actually get the relationship as good as possible right from the start? You know, I said it before, I'll say it again, communication is paramount. Um, it's all about having that open channel of communication so that, you know, so that I or the legal practitioner understands what are the needs that need to be met, having a conversation about how to achieve those needs in the most efficient, cost-effective manner. Um, you know, at Oric, in our tech company's practice, this is what we do. It's the bread and butter of our practice. And so, you know, we have a team of people, hundreds of lawyers, at varying levels, but all impeccably trained, uh, who we can deploy so that we have the right resource for the right task in the right moment on the right time frame. Um, I think, you know, again, there are many things that create a really, really great working relationship, but at the top of the priority list, at least for me, is communication and uh, being open, transparent, honest, when things go well, being honest, when things don't go well, being honest, when a you know, client asks for, a, you know, a timeline or a response on a time frame that is just absolutely impossible. Um, you know, being honest about that rather than say you can do it and then not deliver it. I, I never believe in uh, agreeing to something that I can't deliver. On the other hand, you know, as I, as I hope you will will agree, I will strive to meet uh, and my teams will strive to meet any deadline that we can that's you know realistic and within the realm of possibility. Um, but having that rapport so that you know there the expectations are set up front, I think is really, that's the critical piece. And, and I think it's a great tip to finish the interview. Thank you, Ellen. I think there was gold nuggets everywhere during the interview. So thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure.
Thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure always. Um, you're, you're, uh, I'll, I'll say this to the entire public audience, but you're one of my favorite clients and you know, TK is a favorite client of, of all of us at Oric, and the reason is because you guys are just great people, great to work with, um, and because we have a great and always open line of communication. So it's my pleasure as much as, uh, certainly as much as not more than yours, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.